Welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Lori Pierce. Today, I'd like to welcome Jeremy Carlin, 7th Ward Alderman of City of Galesburg. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. I'm so glad you could be here. Today, we're going to talk about a very important subject, and that would be abandoned homes, not only in Galesburg, probably in the Quad Cities, but today we're talking about Galesburg. So can you briefly tell us, Mr. Alderman, a little bit about the community and the things you do there? Sure. Uh, the city of Galesburg is a, a city of approximately 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. It's uh, about uh, 50 miles from Peoria and 50 miles from the Quad City on I-74. Uh, we have been a, a, an industrial uh, city uh, that has changed with the, the, the flight of manufacturing jobs from the Midwest. Um, we've uh, been a uh, farming community. Uh, we're now a, we've been a railroad community. We, the railroad came to Galesburg uh, in the 1850s, uh, and we are now the the second largest hub on the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad system. Um, we are a college town. Uh, the two colleges, Knox College and uh, Carl Sandburg uh, Community College. Um, we're a town trying to find itself in a period of flux for ourselves, uh, and we've been hit hard uh, by the economic downturn in 2008, like many towns and many communities throughout the Midwest and the United States. And we are, or we're trying to come to terms with that. And uh, we have vacant homes, uh, people, uh, people who uh, just simply walked away from their homes because the mortgages were far, uh, far greater than the worth of their house. We also we have an aging population in our town, and also we have aging aging housing. And so we have a population that's unable to keep up uh, the maintenance of their homes, and we're, we're struggling with that. And so uh, it's kind of reached a, a, a point in which we're starting to talk about it um, uh, outwardly and trying to come up with some solutions. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, very important to talk about it and, you know, find out some solutions for that. Well, absolutely, because if you think about it, when, when there's a vacant home that gets so bad that we have to tear it down, uh, the city and the community pays for it three times. Uh, the first time we pay for it, obviously, is is the cost of the upkeep of the property all along. We're mowing the yards, we're pass putting liens on the property, we're, we're doing that. Um, eventually, also, we, t we have the costs of tearing down the property, uh, and uh, the city absorbs that, and rarely can we ever recoup it. But also, the people in the neighborhood, they're not able to realize the full value of the properties uh, that they have, their house that they've worked so hard sure. to get because of the, uh, the, the house, the eyesore that's next to them that yeah. brings down the value of their own home. So a city pays for deteriorating properties and, and, and demolishing properties three times. Wow, yeah. Well, are there neighborhoods that are abandoned that the city has to protect from the homeless? Well, I, I think it's a, it's a, uh, a deteriorating properties and vacant properties pose a, a number of different issues. It's not just homeless people coming in, but it's a, you know, an itinerant people uh, using the property, but also uh, people, it, it's then a, kind of a magnet for criminal activity as well. And yeah. Um, we've had act we've had instances in Galesburg where people have set up meth labs uh, in in this in these properties, but it's um, it kind of mostly really adds to the idea of um, there's the broken windows theory, where in a neighborhood um, it kind of goes to a sense of lawlessness in generally uh, generally, where in a neighborhood it, it, you know when someone feels like they can just throw trash. Uh, on the ground, the, the, the area starts to deteriorate, the building that is vacant, the windows get broken by people who are, are just you know, damaging property, and it lends itself to a, a, a feeling that there is no law enforcement, and it lends itself to more serious crimes being committed. Um, this idea of, uh, of a broken windows theory, and, and trying then to crack down on low-level crime, has worked in New York City over the in the 1980s and the 1990s to really reduce crime, most very, very significant crime in the city. And so there have been people, citizens in my community, who've been talking about that as well. In Galesburg, there's a, a general sense that it's getting a little less safe. Okay. And you know that could be 
people who have lived there for 50 years having right. a sense of what it used to be yeah. and then f seeing the decline of the community and their concern. But it also, it could be many other things. And as I've met with my constituents in, in my ward uh, over my last two elections, over social media, I have office hours, and they talk to me about that. They talk to me about they're concerned about walking down the street and a, a loose dog gets out. Gets out. They're mm -hmm. concerned about allowing their children to to play in the front yard. And if you think about Galesburg, I mean, we are trying to get people to come to Galesburg and live there, grow the population. Mm -hmm. And the only way we're going to do it, but people, well, that people move to Galesburg and small towns like that because they want small town. Right. And if we're not able, and small town, that means good schools, that means the amenities that people come to expect, it means low traffic rates, you know, a five minute commute. Yeah. But it also means safety. Uh, and uh, we need uh, we need our town to be safe. Having having properties that look good uh, lends to the attractiveness. Having properties that are maintained and that are occupied uh, lends itself to a community that's safer. Yeah. Well, if you do have a property that's maybe not being upkept, are there fines for that property? Right. The, right now, the we have kind of there's a carrot and stick approach, right? We have a stick approach, which is uh, if your property is not main uh, is uh, if mainly if your grass isn't kept up, okay. uh, we uh, we will fine you for that. And if we have to come and mow it for you, we will mow it and then we will put a lien on your property. What we're trying to come up with in Galesburg is kind of a, a minimum standard. Uh, of property maintenance. What is that going to look like? What is the, the, the low end of, uh, or the common denominator that we can expect from our, our business properties as well as our residential properties? Because again, we're trying to get make Galesburg look like a, a good place. We want to put our best foot forward when people come in and make a good appearance or a good first impression. And we want, so particularly in our entrance ways, we've been thinking about this idea that we need to make sure that we are uh, um, putting our makeup on and looking good. Yeah. Uh, so we don't, right now, we have a, a stick approach where we find people. Yeah. Once we put into place a, a property maintenance code, we also put in what's called an administrative hearing process. It's, a, it's used by many communities in Illinois where we don't have to then go to court and then prove it and then, well, we always have to prove it, but go to right. court and... Um, ask police officers on their overtime to come in. Administratively, it's, a, it's less formal. Uh, the person who's been cited comes in, um, and then the administrative hearing judge has the ability to be more flexible. He right. can say, you know, Mr. Johnson, if you paint your house, you know, in the next 60 days, then I, I'll waive the fine. Sure. Also, but as a part of that, you know, you're, you're talking about, um, talking about enforcement which has been a, a, very, a, a difficulty for us in Galesburg. Uh, we've not done it well. We've kind of done it, done it heavy-handedly. Uh, we've done it inconsistently because, you know, people can say, you know, just like on a, on a highway when a police officer might stop you for speeding and you'd say, oh, why don't you stop that other guy? We have that same problem in our community and every other community is the same way. Sure. Um, the enforcement officer would come to the house and say, you know, your grass is high or you have um, a car that seemingly is abandoned on your lawn. You need to get rid of it. And the person can say, well, but, you know, four houses down, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're on a complaint-based uh, uh, approach, you have that inconsistency in our enforcement. We need to do a better job of trying to en enforce these rules but not do it so heavy-handed. Uh, and... Uh, we're, we're struggling with that. We're trying to come up with a, an approach uh, that, uh, that makes sense for us. Sure. And then it sounds like you had said earlier, if they were just abandoned, then the city has to incur those costs. Well, right. I mean, what, what happens is that the city, if it's abandoned, uh, and first of all, it's hard to know exactly when a, a, a building becomes abandoned or not. You only really, in our, in our current framework, we only start to we know, start to know when a building is abandoned when it starts to look bad. Sure. Uh, we need a system by which uh, we do better than that, uh, and we can talk about that in a little bit. But uh, uh, what we need, the you know, with the vacant homes, we learn about it, and then we you know, start upkeeping keeping them up. What I think we 
when I spoke with, we had a public a set of public hearings in Galesburg, and one of the main things that we heard from our constituents is trying to recoup those costs of upkeep uh, from any party that is interested in the property itself. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, the primary owner is long gone, right? But who right. still owns the property? But the lender. And there was a there was really a, a, a sense of anger uh, from our constituents, where um, where it was a sense that lenders took advantage of people, that they extended credit to people who may not, under normal circumstances, deserve credit, who under normal circumstances everyone would recognize that they weren't ready for the responsibility of home ownership. But nonetheless, the loan, the, the lender, in the days of easy credit uh, and free lending, extended the loan, the, they, um, they got it, uh, and then eventually, with the, again, with, the, with the, the recession in 2008, they weren't able to keep up with the, the payments, or it was a variable rate, and then the rate yeah. skyrocketed, and they couldn't, for whatever reason, they abandoned the property. My constituents have talked about that, you know, the lender made a bad or even predatory business decision that the lender should then be responsible for the upkeep of the vacant home. And, you know, we're going to look hard at whether or not we can go after essentially other lien holders, other mortgage holders, to make them responsible for fixing these properties rather than making the whole community responsible. Because if you think about it, the, the business lends the money, and then it's a bad business decision, gets to walk away from it, uh, at least walk away from the upkeep, sure. until they foreclose. They foreclose on the property. They wipe out all of our liens as a part of the foreclosure process, and then is able to sell the property yet again. You know, I think to anyone that would be seemingly unfair. Yeah. Well, it sounds like we have a lot more to talk about here today. So why don't you just stay here, and we can join, this, you know, have some more conversation, and just stay tuned. We'll be right back to learn more about abandoned properties. Got a new TV, computer, or cell phone? Waste Commission of Scott County will properly recycle your old e-waste. So don't worry about your data and information. Not sure what items are considered e-waste? It's simple. Anything with a screen or circuit board. No appointment necessary. Just stop by our e-waste facility to drop off your items. The best part? It's free for Scott and Rock Island County residents. E-waste recycling. Good for the environment. Easy for you. Not sure what to do with all those paint cans, cleaners, and other harmful items under the sink and in your garage? This material poses a health risk and is harmful to the environment, so it can't be thrown out. Go to wastecom.com and make an appointment to bring in your hazardous material. We will dispose of it properly, and here's the best part. It's free for Scott and Rock Island County residents. Proper disposal of hazardous material. Good for the environment, easy for you. See these hands? They grip the wheel of a Humvee in Afghanistan. These hands? Six years treating soldiers. Twelve years flying choppers. We know you're strong, but sometimes you need a helping hand. You served us, now let us serve you. The Iowa City VA Healthcare System. You're watching TBN, part of the Trinity Broadcasting family of networks. Welcome back to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Lori Pierce. Today we're talking with Jeremy Carlin, 7th Ward Alderman of City of Galesburg. Jeremy, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Today we're talking about abandoned properties, and you were talking about your constituents and when you guys get together and they talk to you about abandoned properties. Right. Well, you know... This recent push in, in, in Galesburg it came from our, our constituents, and uh, we always deal with this issue, but it, uh, there was a group of constituents who lived in the central part of Galesburg who were tired of seeing this problem go unaddressed uh, in, a, in a vibrant way. And uh, they started meeting together, uh, and then they uh, dragged uh, their aldermen in who then dragged me in as another alderman. Sure. Uh, and then we started meeting, and they met with our city manager. And then we realized that we needed to, 
we needed to expand the conversation, that it wasn't simply what was happening in their four or five streets in their neighborhood, but it was clearly a citywide problem. And in order to start developing, uh, I guess, a political uh, force behind this or okay. uh, uh, momentum behind what we've been doing, we decided to have a, a public hearing at City Hall, which, is pretty, which was very well attended. The room was full. Wow. Uh, we had that uh, about in the beginning of September, uh, and we, uh, people came and talked about their experiences, that they talked about uh, the house next door. Primarily, that the house next door, this is what happened, and it got torn down. And some people talked about uh, it was it was a wide a wide sweeping conversation, and it was it was illuminating. There was a particular part of of the meeting that it went something like this: uh, this person came up and said that he buys homes and he flips them and then he sells them, and that's how he makes money. He does that in Galesburg and in Monmouth. And he has this particular property in Galesburg, which he just simply can't sell because the property next door is deteriorated and the porch is going bad and the house isn't painted and the grass is tall. And, uh, and he complained that he wasn't getting the full value of his investment. Sure. And, and of course, you know, that's, you know, we don't like to see that happen. But about 20 minutes later, a person came up to the microphone and identified himself as the person who owned that property. And he said that, of course, you know, that he was mortified. And of course, he wants to fix his property and that he can't because he had a job at Maytag and he lost it 10 years ago. And now he can't keep up with his property. And he's working, trying to string together minimum wage jobs to feed his family. And he, at one point, he was in Abingdon living in a tent doing a, um, a, uh, a, uh, a minimum wage job. Abingdon's about 15 miles away from us. And he's, he's doing everything he could, but he just can't. And it doesn't help him when the city keeps on him, you know, over and over again, banging at this, when there's clearly um, that it's not a fact that he doesn't know about it. It's not a fact that he's not, right. uh, not willing. He's just is unable. And really what that brought home to us is this, is that whatever we do with this issue of abandoned properties with vacant homes, it needs to be a comprehensive solution. Uh, on one hand, we need to set standards and that we also need to have enforcement of those standards, but also that we need to be hand, uh, 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 extending our hand out to those individuals who are unable to fix their homes right. because of either age, you know, you're 90 years old and it's, you already own your property. And it's much to you, you stay in your house because you've earned it and it's less expensive than living somewhere else, but you can't now you know, mow the yard or fix this or fix that mm -hmm. or paint the house and you're on a fixed income. Same if you're physically disabled, if you have a, an injury and therefore you are, are now in, in, in a chair or you can't walk or, you, or whatever, you can't carry. Right. Uh, also for finances, because you've had a, a setback economically, you lost your job, um, you're trying to, you know, you're deciding between painting your house and you know, feeding your family, you know, everyone's going to feed the family. Sure. And so we realized, even our city manager is saying this, and the city council is saying this, that in part and parcel with setting up enforcement and setting standards, we're going to have to set up programs by which we are able to help people meet those standards. It's part of being part of a small town, too. Right. Um, just it's, sometimes I think it's easier to form that cohesiveness and, and make a difference sometimes. Absolutely. I mean, it's impossible to be anonymous in the town. It's mm -hmm. the reason why we take showers and put on makeup before we go to the store, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and are embarrassed when we don't. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's impossible. It's what attracted me to Galesburg mm -hmm. in the first place. I yeah. come from upstate New York. I moved to Galesburg, and I realized that, you know, it is a place where if you are motivated, that uh, perhaps if you're articulate about, to able to identify the problem and articulate about the solution, that anything is possible. If you think about it, you know, too often we send our 300 graduates of Galesburg High School and our 400 graduates of Carl Sam of uh, Knox College and the, uh, the graduates of Carl Sandburg we could hold on to them, and that's a thousand people every year that could grow our community, mm -hmm. create jobs, um, create kind of a, an environment of prosperity. But every year we we export them out, 
uh, and we were, st and I, I feel really like it's a lost opportunity. These are people because of either by choice or by uh, virtue of their birth have <laughs> have been in Galesburg, and they we've already had the opportunity to make the pitch, yeah. and we kind of lost, and they're they're gone. Too often we say to our children in Galesburg, "Go out into the world and find success. Go, but you can't find it here in Galesburg." And we need to reverse that. Sounds like you guys are looking for the answers and to make that difference where I do believe you guys are going to make a turnaround. Absolutely. Now, I mean, I kind of, I mean, I went really, you know, big picture, you know, uh, you know, the, the 300 mile view, yep. uh, but kind of let's get back down to, um, uh, back down to the city. You know, our city, like any other city has good parts and bad parts, right? Our city has uh, places that there maybe more affluent people live in the other town apart and less affluent live in the other. Sure. And it's easy to say, oh, the, you know, that's, you know, that's the other, it's a South Side problem or, right. uh, or, you know, whatever. It's not my problem. But we came to discover um, in Galesburg that it's, in fact, a citywide problem. Uh, we, um, we, found out where all, we found out where all the vacant homes were. Uh, and then uh, we got their addresses, and we gave them to our GIS coordinator. We had them put them on a map. And we came to discover that um, the, it's a widespread problem throughout the whole city. So w when you look at the map, y you see that actually it doesn't discriminate. Yeah. Uh, that from the north side of the town, the south side of the town, east and west, the downtown area, you know, it's also going to take partners in, in this solution as well. It's not just the neighborhood groups and the citizens, and it's not just city government, you know, with its rules and resources, but we're also going to need the other uh, community stakeholders to get involved as well. There are a number of different ways that this can, uh, can happen. Um, if you think about Knox College, for example, Knox College is a, 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 a small liberal arts college in, in our community. It's a, a magnificent school. If I had known about it, perhaps I would have gone there as well. Uh, it's also bordered by a community, uh, a neighborhood that is deteriorating. Um, and, uh, and if you think about it, um, as people come to visit the school, they would say, oh, I love the school. You know, where will my son or daughter live? Oh, perhaps, you know, in a dorm, but then off campus and they look around and the, the neighborhood is, you know, doesn't make a good first impression. And perhaps then the school loses some people that might, might go there. If you think about it, if Galesburg, if the Knox College, let's say, of their uh, multi-million dollar endowment, it could be greater, of course, took a million dollars and said, you know, we're going to take that million dollars and we are going to buy, identify the 20 worst properties in our neighborhood. And some of them we're going to tear down. It will give, we'll give full market value to the people who own them. Sure. Uh, they would... Uh, Buy, uh, buy these properties, and some they would tear down, and some they would uh, some fix, and then be able to offer it to whomever, um, uh, and help out perhaps other people as well. On that million dollars, what the market right now would be a, a return of maybe fifty or sixty thousand dollars each year if they put it in the market and they got a return. But by fixing up 20 properties in their neighborhood, they were able to get two full-time students to come to Knox that didn't come before. The, the city, the, the college then is making closer to 70 or $80,000. And so you can see in that little, in that kind of, it's obviously not as simple as that, but sure. um, you can see in that little microcosm that it's in Knox College's business best interest mm -hmm. in terms of investment that they could fix up these properties and then try to attract more students to come to their college. Sure. The same with the Galesburg as well. I mean, as we're trying to attract people to come to Galesburg, right now the way that our laws are set up is that we can't really intervene in a property until it poses a safety risk. It's kind of like waiting till the, when the walls are falling down, then the, right. then the city can come in. We need to be able to get in sooner. We, you know, Cities do a bad job of it, you know. We're, you know, we have to do give things like due process and have to give people their day in court before we sure. take their property away. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that's a cumbersome and expensive process. Right. If there are community foundations, there are entities like this in Galesburg that can uh, that either exist currently or could be formed. 
who would then buy these properties and then control these properties before it goes to the point where they pose a public health risk, that the walls are going to fall down on people. They can buy these properties. They would be a less expensive fix to begin with, right? Some properties will get demolished. And people would say in those neighborhoods where lots of properties have been demolished, they say it's a blessing, that it's wonderful, that their neighborhood is just looks great. But for other places where the property, you know, isn't down to the point where, you know, it needs to be demolished, it can be fixed. And then we can say to, let's say, that family of four, you know, family of four who lives elsewhere, if you came to Galesburg and agreed to live in this, in our home for, let's say, five years, we're going to give you $10,000 off of the property. Um, and we will forgive that debt. It will make it a loan. Sure. And we'll forgive that debt if you live in that property for five years. They live in the property. They pay taxes. Their children go to our schools. And we get the state money from the state for their children going there when the state pays its money. <laughs> and, <Right>. um, <laughs> um, and so from an intergovernmental perspective and from a community-wide perspective, perspective, us buying that house for $20,000, fixing it up for another ten, getting that family to move to Galesburg for another five years, we win. It's a win-win. Yeah. And, uh, but it, it takes this. At the end of the day, we've talked about a lot of things here today. Mm -hmm. We've talked about uh, government involvement. We've talked about government giving resources. We've talked about neighborhoods coming together and fixing properties. We've talked about uh, community-wide organizations getting involved. But really, it takes um, a little faith and a little courage. Mm -hmm. These are solutions that may not work and we can say that there is risk and we can always go down the list as we brainstorm that oh that won't work and this won't work but our fear of failure sometimes paralyzes us mr carlin thank you so much for all of this great information and for um, everyone there working about the abandoned properties and thank you viewers for tuning in today and we'll see you next time on joy in our town This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and made possible by your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep Joy in Our Town brought to your home every day. So write Joy in Our Town, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Watching TBN, part of the Trinity Broadcasting family of networks.